If I can't be as a dog outside, hopefully I'll be able to talk over the dog. Alright, this is the only time I can uh, post this video. Pretty busy after I post this video, therefore this is the only time I have to make it. It's going to be on terms, alright? And by terms I mean different things we say, uh, terms, uh, uh, descriptions of techniques and how that tends to get in the way. And uh, if you know anything about me, I try to point out the irrationality of certain things so we can get back on course and do the things that we need to really be doing and training and anything else. Uh, so I'm going to point out some of the irrationality when it comes down to looking at terms and just training according to terms. All right. Uh, on occasion, a gentleman may contact me and say, well, you know what, safe, I really want to train with you, but, you know, I can't train with you, I'm too far away, but there are some people who, uh, who teach combatives or teach self-protection or self-defense uh, where I live, and I would like for you to look at their website and maybe give me some advice. For me, personally, even when I was boxing, it might have been, there were guys that I liked, you know, guys I thought were really good fighters, but I might have studied two. Kickboxing is one. Wrestling, there's probably two. Uh, MMA, I'm not, you know, there's two or three, you know, that, that are my favorites. Um, you know, so, you know, it's really, when it comes down to combatives, there might be maybe two. Uh, for the most part, most people, I just, I look and I, because I do my own thing and what works for me works, I generally don't have any interest in what most of everybody else does. It's very rare when I do. So if someone asks me to look at a website, I might hem and haw about it, but if somehow they're very far from me and they sound sincere, I tell them, give me 72 hours and I'll look. Often what ends up happening is I will see a website where a guy has these machine guns and going, brah, 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 but he's teaching combatives. Now, in the United States, that's a big deal. You know, it's a gun culture. You know, when you think about the samurai, you think of the sword. You think about the Apache or the native, you think of uh, the native uh, you think about uh, you think about the knife. You think about the uh, you think about the the, uh, the Vikings. You think about the swords. You think about the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the African. You think about the spear. When you think about the West and America, you think about guns. So when people look at that, it's you know brah, brah, he's qualified to teach combatives. It really never dawns on them that combatives is hand to hand, hand to weapon, weapon to weapon, and maybe guns, right? It doesn't dawn on most people, you know, so they see this shooting, and before you know it, yes, he's qualified. Now, one of the problems comes up also when we look at that and we assume that that means combatives. But there's something else. Give me another example. Let's say you have a Navy SEAL, right? And this Navy SEAL has done two tours in Afghanistan, right? Prior to that, he comes from a very... Beautiful neighborhood, born and raised in a beautiful neighborhood, never had any street confrontations in his neighborhood, uh, not a big problem of bullying in his school, but he did go right into uh, 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 the Navy and became a Navy SEAL. He did two tours in Afghanistan, expert marksman. Now you have him, and then you have someone born and raised in maybe Liverpool, or born and raised in maybe Brixton, or born and raised in maybe Manchester, born and raised in maybe Chicago or Detroit, or, Cal or, or New York, or Newark, right? And these particular people have dealt with violence. You know, not all the time, but they've, they've dealt with it, right? Okay. Now, if you had that Navy SEAL, and he was teaching combatives, right? And he had a website, and then you had that other person who was born and raised in those urban areas, right? Where you're trying to learn yourself, what you're trying to learn, just teach, what you're trying to learn to protect yourself from. He dealt with it, you know, at least on a weekly basis for one point, some point in his or her life, right? When you look at that, which website would you go to? Well, you likely would go to the Navy SEAL website. Why? Because of the term, Navy SEAL. You probably wouldn't think. That if he came from a very nice neighborhood, and if in that neighborhood he didn't even have any fights, not a whole lot, but just didn't have many fights at all, right? If by chance then when he went to Afghanistan, he wasn't, he was in the mountains and he was doing quite deal, uh, maybe some shooting, but pretty much long range, it doesn't dawn on you that he's probably not very qualified to teach you how to survive in urban areas. Hand to hand. Why? Because he hasn't necessarily dealt with hand to hand. 
But because we're talking about terms, you would think Navy SEAL. Someone born and raised in that area. Navy SEAL, someone born and raised in that area. Someone who was in Afghanistan, someone who was in Brixton, Manchester, Harlem, Detroit, Chicago, Newark, right? Terms. We're talking about terms. Now, there are some people that might say, well, and this is where it's going to, it's going to get controversial, but if you really know where I'm coming from, people, you'll say, safe is right on this one, too. When you look at American, American armed services, when you look at their armed forces, I will have to say, and again, people are not going to like it, but they are the least well-trained when it comes down to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. I had to say it. There's some of the least well-trained when it comes down to hand-to-hand, -to -hand, and I will tell you why. Two reasons. One is they generally do not have any day-to-day, -day, any day-to-day -day contact with the perceived enemy, like, say, Israeli forces, right, or some other forces, okay? They do not have, or like, say, British forces that might be uh, in the streets of Belfast, right? Something like that, for example, right? So now, when you look at that, it may be, right, that those Navy SEALs are trained, but they're not trained to deal with the day-to-day -day perceived enemy. So what people train them? The people who train the armed services, you will be surprised, are some of the least qualified people to be teaching combatives. And this is unfortunate, but it's a fact. Nobody wants to say it, but it's true. You still have people training. Yes, some of the most elite forces are training with someone coming at them with a knife like this. Screaming. Or someone coming at them with a knife like that. And if you know anything about knife attacks from me or maybe some of the, more other, uh, some of the other reputable uh, combative uh, teachers or lecturers, you will know that knife attacks just simply don't happen like that. Right? So what do Navy SEALs do when they get out? Or what do Marines do when they get out? Or what do elite Army uh, uh, soldiers do when they get out? Well, they go and they find people who are qualified to teach how to survive in serious issues with people, not necessarily just urban issues, but people who are ultra-violent, right? People who are just sociopaths, how to deal with those people. Because let's face it, you, I mean, you can go out in the countryside and some nut will be out there. Many nuts go out there because they're not really detected that easily, right? But we're just talking about dealing with wanton violence, you see? So, why is it, why is it that some of the most commercial people teach the armed services of the United States? Why is it that some of the most commercial people? Because they think, the people who contract them actually think that those are the most qualified people, right? And it's very easy to think that because the most qualified people that teach combatives probably have a, a fairly small student body. They probably teach in their garages or in their attics or in their basements or have maybe a little storefront or something like that. Some of them may teach one or two weeks in, in one or two days a week in a local park if it's in a warm climate or might teach one or two days in a local recreation center. But they maybe don't have big schools and most of them simply do not. The most qualified people don't. Right? Because they teach with a certain intensity that simply is not very marketable to today, with, and particularly people, like I say, in the United States and other people. Okay. So now, when you look at that, what are we talking about? We're talking about Navy SEAL, someone born and raised in that area. Someone born and raised in that area has dealt with certain things in Navy SEAL. We're talking about terms. So now if we look at combatives. Let's look at combatives. Now, you have people who teach combatives, and they try to give the impression that traditional martial arts does not work. But here we go. Here we go. If you look at the origin of so-called traditional, mar uh, traditional, if you look at the origin, so, supposing, I'm, excuse me, of combatives, right? Most combative teachers will trace their combative lineage back to World War II combatives, right? Perfected by Mr. Uh, uh, William Fairbairn, Fairbairn, right? And Sykes, right? Other characters like that. Okay. What they do not tell you, though, is that those particular people, right, who started the military combatives during World War II, they did not start it from a boxing base. They did not start it necessarily from a wrestling base. Although they were good boxers and they did do some wrestling. The fact of the matter is, is that what they did was they looked at the Oriental. They looked at the traditional martial arts, 
judo, jujitsu, Japanese jujitsu, kung fu, yes, kung fu, and karate, and took those things, took what was best from those things, okay, and then implemented them and came up with what is actually combatives. So today, let's look at two techniques that people use. In combatives, right, they use a face rake, right? So they will face rake. They will grab and face rake, or face rake from here, or uh, rake over rake, right here so this is what they get okay it works and particularly if you have nails it works okay can get this kind of flinch response very painful right you have uh, pain receptors nerve receptors or, or nerves that are under the skin I've seen people get punched in the face and keep going right get punched in the head and keep going you scratch them you bite them they scream like babies I've seen it happen does the rake work yes absolutely but where did it come from? Here's the kicker. It didn't come from boxing. It didn't come from wrestling. Where it came from was traditional martial arts. Now, look at Hungar Kung Fu. Now, one of the problems with Hungar Kung Fu, and you can see it, you know, on YouTube, is Hungar spars against Hungar. So they're going like this, and they're doing all like that, and like this, and like that, right? And it looks ridiculous. It really does look ridiculous, I have to say it. And one reason is because if you're not sparring against a boxing base, okay, a boxing base, then the martial art you're training with is really not going to be maximally functional. Functional, And I'll tell you why. Because when people even sucker punch you, they think they're throwing a boxing punch. Most people think that when they're street fighting, no matter how crude it is, they think they are indeed boxing. Therefore, if you are not training and sparring against a boxing base, someone who at least is trying to box minimally well, right? If you're not doing that, then your martial art is not being really truly tested. So hung guard, does it work? It probably works. There's techniques that work in every martial art. But Hungar sparring Hungar is ridiculous. This is why Wing Chun usually doesn't work, right, against a boxer. Because Wing Chun is sparring Wing Chun. You have to spar boxing so you have to be a force to modify what you're doing in order to be functional in the street. But if we look at that, let's throw away the fact that Hungar looks ridiculous sparring Hungar. Let's throw that away. But what is this? It still doesn't deny the truth that that is actually a tiger claw. That's what it is. It's that same tiger claw that many people laughed at for years. It's that same tiger claw that people who teach combatives laughed at for years, right? It's a traditional technique. It's a tiger claw. That's what it is. Now, let's look at this. The axe hand. Many people call it the axe hand. It's the axe hand, and people are so beside themselves over the axe hand. But what is the axe hand? Some of you karate enthusiasts are laughing right now. The axe hand is that karate chop. It's that karate chop that many of you laughed at years ago. That many of these combative teachers laughed at years ago when someone would go, Yeah, right, you're going to karate chop me. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what they would laugh at. Right? You know, yeah, you know, karate chop. Here we go. Here you go. Right? But now it's called the axe hand. No, it's not. It's a karate chop. Let me give you an example of something. Here's one of my karate teachers right here. Okay? This man right here. Here's one of my karate teachers. Right? Okay. What he's doing is he's breaking three bricks. Three bricks. All right? Three bricks. Okay? With what? He's breaking three bricks with a chop. A shuto. Right? He's breaking three bricks. Okay? Now, many people call that an axe hand. That's from 1972. How many people teaching combatives today were even training in 1972? Right? Some of them, I would imagine, wasn't even born in 1972. But all of a sudden, we have the axe hand, right? That same karate chop people laughed at. So what's the problem? Terms. Terms. So when you hear someone say, well, traditional martial arts doesn't work and they're teaching combatives, then you need to ask them, where did the techniques come from that they're using? Now, sure, you need to use things in a ballistic manner. I wouldn't say that Paul and Malinaji is ready for the street, but he's a boxer. There's no way I would say that boxing is fake. There's no way I would say that boxing doesn't work, but Paul and Malinaji's approach to boxing would get him killed in a street fight. Okay? True. So, should you have to take these techniques from karate or from Japanese jiu-jitsu or from kung fu and test them and, and not take the whole thing? You know, you don't take the whole thing. But clearly, when we look at modern-day combatives, 
The face rake is a tiger claw. The axe hand is a chop. What's the problem? Terms. Now, lastly, a man thanked me for uh, giving Wing Chun its, uh, its due. I am not an ambassador for Wing Chun. Wing Chun is just one of the martial arts that I trained in. I trained in. I'm qualified to teach six martial arts from beginning to advance. Wing Chun is not one of them. I got to the middle range of Wing Chun. I started training Wing Chun after having boxed for many years. So the teacher allowed me to go into the middle and advanced class and, of course, learn the forms, but I only got up to uh, uh, Chum Chu. Okay? That's it. I didn't learn B.U.G. I know something of B.U.G., but I didn't learn it in class. All right? The fact of the matter is, is that I'm around mid-range. So if I was to teach Wing Chun, I would have to say, because of my own personal integrity, I would say I teach Wing Chun concepts, not Wing Chun, out of respect for other people who have put much more time into Wing Chun than I have. So I am not an ambassador of Wing Chun. When I have talked about Wing Chun, I was talking about something that I have used. I have extracted from Wing Chun, and it worked for me in the way that I particularly used it. I didn't necessarily use the stance, but in the way that I used it. So a gentleman thanked me for saying that. Now I want to talk about some terms. Now, if I was to say stabbing someone, and this will help you understand what terms go, and I will end the video with this, with these few terms. If I was to say if you poke somebody in the eye, in the eye, it would work. It would at least get you a French response. Most of you would say yes, absolutely. It would. Yes. If I was to poke someone in the eye, it would get some kind of response. Yes, absolutely. Could be a fight stopper. Maybe. You probably would agree to that. The minute I call it B-U-G, you say Wing Chun doesn't work. See what I mean? Terms. Now, if I was to ask you if when you tie up, you're trying to not break someone's kneecap, or you're trying to trip them, or you're stomping on a foot, or trying to throw them, or trying to sweep them, or trying to throw them off balance, or pull, or push them off balance. If I asked you if that was viable, if that's something you should try to do once you're inside, and I'll repeat. If I ask you if once you're inside on someone and you're tied up, that you should try to maybe bash their kneecap, kneecap or stomp their foot or sweep them or throw them or knock them off balance or something like that, right? If I told you, you know, if I asked you if that was something you would try to do or was, it was really something you should try to do in street fight, if I asked you if that was, you would say yes. You would say yes, of course. Once you're inside and you can stomp somebody's foot or you can trip them, or you can throw them, or you can sweep them, of course, absolutely, right? But if I said chi gurk, if I mentioned chi gurk, you would say Wing Chun doesn't work. If my hands are up like this, if my hands are up like this, and I need to get out of the way, right? And I can't parry it, and, and it just, the punch comes up on me, right hand comes up on me, right? And I, I, I you know, and I just turn like this, right? I mean, I, I just turn like that, okay? And I said, you know, I got out of way. You would say, wow, that's great. You know, man, wow, wow, you need to do a video on that. How did you just turn like that? You know, wow, did you, right? You would say, hey, that works. I know it works. You can't get out of the way. You don't really, you can't really slip. So you just kind of have this flinch. You know, this flinch, you just move like that, right? You would say, great. But the minute I say bong sao, the minute I say bong sao, you say, Wing Chun doesn't work, right? So this was happened. Why does it why do you say that? Because of terms. The term. The terms. Yes, stabbing somebody in the eye, poking someone in the eye works. You say BUG doesn't work. If I say trying to manipulate someone's limbs, their legs, stomping their feet, kicking their kneecap out, tripping them, sweeping them, pushing them off balance, pulling them off balance, turning them off balance. Right? Twisting them off balance. If I was to ask you if that worked, you would say yes. The man I say was Chi Gurk, you would say Wing Chun doesn't work. If I moved out of the way in a certain way, right? Where the punch would ride from here to here. And I would just move it from here to here. My elbow from here to here. And it would ride from the elbow to, to the wrist. And I would deflect it with that. And I said, oh, well, you know, I, I did that. It's a great, great arm, forearm block. You would say, wow, forearm block. Yeah, that's good. Right? But the minute I say bong sao, well, Wing Chun doesn't work. So essentially, what am I talking about? I'm talking about terms. 
That's what I'm talking about, terms. Not a particular martial art, but terms. So when you start really start talking about self-protection, you are not talking about lifting a style or bashing a style. What you're talking about is taking what is best from whatever art has it and implementing it into your self-protection approach. All right? So we have to be careful about terms. All right? Okay. When we fight, can't save crime. Train hard, train smart. See you next